Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. It is my honor and privilege to welcome all of you in attendance today on behalf of the Institute's MLK uh, Lecture Committee and Celebration Planning Committee to our 2017 MLK Institute Lecture. Um, it's an important uh, point to make that this is uh, our sixth lecture in a row, uh, and we're pr proud that this tradition is being firmly rooted in the Georgia Tech tradition, and I'm so pleased to see so many people in attendance today. So welcome, and we're glad that you're here. It's been nearly 50 years. It will be 50 years, one year, uh, April 4th in 2018, since Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. And in those 50 years, much has changed, as President Barack Obama said last night, in America, and much remains to be done. Uh, we at Georgia Tech continue to work uh, ardently toward those goals of inclusion as a campus community, and we work very diligently together to make our campus community a model campus community. In those 50 years, many things have changed and many things have remained the same. 50 years after Dr. King's death, we, we still witness many, many things in American society that press us to continue to uh, follow the agenda that he set for us 50 some years ago. If Dr. King were alive today, what would he find as the most pressing social and economic justice issues facing us as a country in the 21st century? What would be his, his assessment of our capacity to arise to these challenges as a country and meet them? And would he in fact be satisfied that we are doing our very best individually and collectively to rise to these challenges. These are some questions that I think about uh, as I individually uh, move throughout life and in my capacity as the Vice President for Institute Diversity here at Georgia Tech. Each year, we have this celebration as a way to commemorate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. And with an ambi ambitious slate of programs, uh, educational, cultural events, service opportunities, and so on, to engage the campus community uh, in a moment of reflection on the ideals that Dr. King espoused. This is a, a, a noble event for us here at Georgia Tech because we are in the, the center of the cradle of, 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 of civil rights movements in this country. And it is befitting that we take the time to spark the light and lead from here at Georgia Tech. At this time, I'd like to ask if there are any elected officials in the audience uh, I'd like to acknowledge them if they're here. We were told some might be here. And if they're late, that's okay too. Uh, so I've done my due diligence on that, Chris, Mr. Brown. Uh, so uh, I'll do that. At this time, I'd like to ask our president, Dr. G.P. Bud Peterson, to come to the stage to provide the official institute welcome for this MLK lecture. Dr. Peterson. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, Dr. Irvin. It's a real pleasure to welcome all of you here to, as uh, Dr. Irvin said, the sixth Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture. Uh, this is one of the high points of our month-long celebration of Dr. King and his legacy and his life. At Georgia Tech, we honor Dr. King's legacy and respect those who advance his cause. We're proud that our institute is here in Atlanta, which is the uh, heart of the American Civil Rights Movement. Our speaker today, Mr. Bakari Sellers, like Dr. King, studied at Morehouse College here in Atlanta and has been to Georgia Tech's campus on several occasions. Um, Mr. Sellers worked as a journalist, a political commentator, and an activist in the area of civil rights, has encouraged Americans to come to grips with some of the difficult challenges and questions we as a nation face. During our undergraduate commencement ceremony last month, we enjoyed a lively address from Dr. Freeman Hrabowski. He's the president of the University of Maryland at Baltimore County and has been in that position since 1992. As a youth, he was already deeply involved in the civil rights movement in his native Alabama. Dr. Hrabowski was, a prominent, was prominently featured in a movie entitled Four Little Girls a 1997 documentary by Spike Lee about the 1963 bombings in Birmingham's 16th Street Baptist Church. Dr. Hrabowski offered a then and now perspective 
of our to our graduates and our friends and their families. Coming from one who was initially involved in the momentous real world, real time movement that helped to shape our nation's perspective, it was enormously impactful. He said, and I quote, in the 60s, when I went to jail with Dr. King, the world was split. He also noted that the diversity that we have at our institutions of higher education today, institutions like UMBC or Georgia Tech, is much greater than it was 50 years ago. And he told our graduates that now is the time that they as leaders can say to our country, our generation will change the world. At Georgia Tech, we are working to prepare our students as leaders and innovators who are equipped to do just that, to handle the challenge that was handed down by Dr. Hrabowski. Today's lecture is a continuation of the month-long celebration of Dr. King. Still to come are several important events, and I hope you'll have an opportunity to participate in some of them. One that we're proud of is the FOCUS program, which begins tomorrow and runs through Saturday. FOCUS gives perspective to our minority graduates, or gives prospective minority graduate students an opportunity to explore the opportunities the graduate school might present for them. How many of the folks in the room participated in the FOCUS program at one point? Yeah, we've got uh, about 20 of you. So it, it is a terrific program. We invite students to come to the campus to look at Georgia Tech, to see what Georgia Tech is doing in a number of fields, but also to encourage them to pursue graduate degrees. Then on Monday, January 16th, we'll observe Georgia Tech's seventh annual Martin Luther King Day of Service, a campus-wide initiative where volunteers will serve in teams and engage in service projects with our Metro Atlanta community pro uh, partners. And then tomorrow through Sunday, Georgia Tech has or organized a Washington, D.C. civil rights tour where 70 of our students and 30 of our faculty members will travel to understand the civil rights movement better from a personal perspective. Dr. King once said, quote, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step towards the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and a struggle. The tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. He also observed that faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. As we reflect, reflect upon his life and work, we're reminded that his dream can be our dream as well. And the, the journey that he started and the steps on the staircase that he talked about can begin for us here at Georgia Tech. Thank you for joining us. And at this point, I'd like to introduce Nigella Nakuna, our student body president. Nigella. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. There we go. My name is Nigella Nakuna, a fourth year industrial engineering student serving as student body president this year. It is such a great honor to be in the room with so many individuals who share the same passion of unifying people on one single premise. The fact that we are all human, each with our own calling and purpose. Each one of us here today has a responsibility to continue to promote acceptance of all types of people and learn from one another to grow this melting pot that allows our nation to progress. Those principles and values of love and acceptance begin when we're young and are truly shaped in college. At Georgia Tech, we are blessed to be surrounded with a divert with a diverse population of students from different cultural backgrounds, faiths, and continents, each bringing various experiences to the classrooms, sports teams, debate clubs, and leadership organizations, just to name a few. Just by being here, we are given one key to this equation of promoting diversity and acceptance. The second key is really our actions. Who we invite to our conversations and social gatherings may be a small decision now, yet they obligate us to interact with people that are different from you and me. These minute learning experiences act as building blocks of more challenging decisions that we have to face later in life. 
whether or not to make decisions with everyone's viewpoints and values in mind. Being a representative for all of the different students at Georgia Tech constantly reminds me to lead by example and to exemplify these necessary qualities to everyone I meet. Today, we have the opportunity to learn from someone who has devoted his career to doing just that. Introducing him will be a close friend and, a, and an exceptional campus leader, Alex Berry. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. <laughs> to the students, staff, faculty, and all of our wonderful guests, allow me to say welcome and good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Alex Berry, a graduating fifth year industrial engineering student. <laughs> With the honor and privilege of introducing our speaker today. Attorney Bakari Sellers is an inspiration to me because of how his fearless nature has driven an impressive list of accomplishments at such a young age. Attending Morehouse College, Sellers was a progressive leader, ultimately serving as his college's student body president. In 2006, as a recent 22-year-old graduate, Attorney Sellers made history by becoming the youngest member of the South Carolina State Legislature and the youngest African-American African elected official in the nation. Sellers' political acumen led him to becoming the 2014 Democratic nominee for the Lieutenant Governor in the state of South Carolina. That coupled with his uncommon ability to reach across the aisle to get things done has led to numerous accolades including being named to Time Magazine's 40 Under 40 list in 2010, as well as 2014. And in 2015, being selected as the Route 100, which is a list of the nation's most influential African Americans. During these strange times in politics, he shares his insights into the political system as a CNN political analyst. Sellers has followed in the footsteps of his father, civil rights leader Cleveland Sellers, in his tireless commitment to service. His father's search for social justice and equality, as well as his never-ending desire to attain the highest level, of, uh, highest level of education possible, is another daily inspiration. Earning his law degree from the University of South Carolina, Sellers currently practices law with a straw law firm. He has utilized his education and knowledge of the law to champion progressive policies to address issues ranging from education to poverty and to preventing domestic violence and childhood obesity. And this is also why we bring him here. At Georgia Tech, where we have made it a priority to use our technological expertise to create the next generation of global citizens. Seller's life and passion depicts how education, civil rights, and equality will be the cornerstones for our future. Attorney Sellers is not here to merely tell us stories, but to help give us perspective on what it takes to set the agenda for the net civil rights movement. Please join me in welcoming Attorney Bakari Sellers. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Right. Did I do it right? I came to Georgia Tech, to the number one technical institute in the world, and I can't work the microphone. <laughs> Are we on? Yep, cool. I want to first, um, my mom and dad would always tell me that the two most important words in the English language were the words thank you. Um, and they're not nearly said enough. Oftentimes you wait on people to pass away or be gone before you tell them how much they mean to you. But I want to say, uh, thank you to a few people today. The first is uh, my new friend, and we're going to tackle some of the world's challenges together, uh, Dr. Irvin. Um, I want to thank you for just inviting me here today and 
of being a part of this amazing campus and this amazing atmosphere. Not often uh, do I get a chance to speak in front of the uh, institution's president that's inviting me. Um, so thank you for taking a, a, a little bit of time out of your, out of your schedule to come and, and, and listen to the words that I have to say today. Uh, Najela, did I pronounce that right? Yeah. Najela, and she just corrected me too. Najela, I get that. <laughs> with Bakari, I get Bacardi, Baraki. <laughs> so I just, I, I, please forgive me. I look forward to meeting you at the top. Uh, we need a lot of help along the way, so I look forward to seeing you out there and meeting you at the top. And uh, to Alex, I was in Chicago last night, and I can tell you that the president didn't even get as good an introduction as I got today. So, uh, thank you all so very much. I, uh, I'm looking forward to having this discussion today and taking a few questions because we're in very interesting times. I don't know if you all realize uh, that there's a lot of things that are happening in the world around us. Um, just last night I had the amazing opportunity to see uh, the 44th President of the United States give his farewell address. Um, I'm a rather emotional man myself, so I was crying, <laughs> but I was not alone. There were about 24,999 other people in the building. <laughs> Um, as well as millions watching along the way. This is a very interesting topic, setting the agenda for the next civil rights movement. And in this discussion today, I hate when people say I'm going to give a lecture, um, because it makes me feel like that I'm going to have to stand up here and speak for hours and hours at a time. So uh, instead of giving a traditional lecture, I guess, uh, today I'm going to treat you all uh, like Elizabeth Taylor treated all seven of her husbands. Um, and that means I'm not going to keep you long. <laughs> but as we, as we go down this path, right, of, of setting the agenda for the next civil rights movement, I, I want to talk to you guys about a journey. Because life is not a singular step. But life is a journey. And every journey, every race that we run, everything that we do, no matter if you were 32 years old or 42 years old, there we go, my voice sounds amazing now. <laughs> um, you have to have a goal. For the purpose of today's discussion, you make me a lot of money over there, man. For the purposes of today's discussion, uh, we're going to have a journey to excellence. And I'm going to apologize beforehand because I know you brought me here and I'm flying back out afterwards to go and spend some time with some CEOs um, and some business executives tomorrow in Washington, D.C., talking about what the first 100 days of the Trump administration will look like, which I don't know why they invited me. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to apologize for marking you with questions that are rooted in such simplicity, but they're necessary to answer it and navigate this journey. The first is, how far have we come? And the next is, where do we go? I think in whatever you're doing, whatever journey you're on in life, uh, whether or not you're on the basketball court like I used to be back in high school and tried to be in college, or whether or not you're in academia, or whether or not you're a student, or whether or not you're trying to be a husband, a good husband, or a father, or whatever you are doing in life, on this journey to excellence, you have to ask yourself those two very simple questions. How far have we come, and where do we go from here? So in answering the first question, how far have we come, I feel as if you have to use some historical context. And for me, I'm a southern boy. I'm from the big city of Denmark, South Carolina, where we have three stoplights and a blinking light. <laughs> and so I like to use a little bit of southern history, and I think back to 1949. In a small county not far away from here in Clarendon County, South Carolina, where the parents decided of African-American children decided they were going to file a lawsuit because they simply wanted their children to have the same opportunities as white children to ride the school buses. That lawsuit was known as Briggs v. Elliott. Briggs v. Elliott became the cornerstone for the landmark case of Brown versus the Board of Education. And let's think about Brown for a minute. When you think about Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas in 1954, Chief Justice Earl Warren got a very rare unanimous opinion. It was 9-0. And that unanimous opinion read that segregation causes a sense of inferiority by placing children in environments not conducive to learning. That was the holding of the case. Segregation causes a sense of inferiority by placing children in environments not conducive to learning. That's just what $100,000 worth of law school will get you dead. It'll just get you some rote memorization. Um, 
But think about it. Over 60 years later, how far have we come? When you look around you and you see that teachers are underpaid, where kids go to school, where their heating and air don't work, where their infrastructure is falling apart, where literally you have kids who they literally steal um, meals and breads and lunches from uh, the, the school lunch counter because if, if they don't take it home, then their little brother and sister won't eat. Where you actually have quarters of shame. That's what we call these education systems where everything is just simply falling apart. Ask yourself that very simple question, how far have we come? Or you think about the fact that when you go to church, and I, I go to a black church, and so on Sunday morning, all the women in the black church, you know, with the big, big hats, they sit on the first two rows. <laughs> but you understand that they, during the week, have to make a decision about whether or not they're going to pay their utility bills or get their prescription drugs. You know, ask yourself that very simple question, how far have we come? You know, I think about the grip of poverty and how it's placed its grasp on both our newborn and elderly alike, and escaping the trap of impoverishment has become synonymous with the proverbial dog that chases his tail. Again, ask yourself that very simple question, how far have we come? And Mr. President, in my 32 years of great wisdom, <laughs> I have come to the resolve that the answer to the question, how far have we come, is that we've made progress, but we still have yet a ways to go. And so as we're on this journey to excellence and we ask ourselves that first question, then we're here, we understand we have some historical context, we ask ourselves how far have we come, we understand that we still have yet a ways to go. Ask yourself that next question, which is where do we go from here? Let me tell you a story. It's about a young man who was born at 633 Frederick Street in Denmark, South Carolina. He went to Voorhees High School, as it was known at the time. And when he graduated Voorhees High School, he went to Howard University. When he got to Howard University, he befriended a man named Stokely Carmichael. It's a hint of irony in this story. Stokely actually graduated from Howard and convinced this young man from Denmark to drop out of school. This young man from Denmark dropped out of school, but he became a part of the freedom struggle of the civil rights movement. You see, Early on in the 60s, they were at Miami University of Ohio preparing for Freedom Summer. And this young man from Denmark, he ended up going on his first civil rights mission into Philadelphia, Mississippi. Has anybody ever been to Philadelphia? Not Pennsylvania now, Philadelphia, Mississippi. It's about the size of this room right here. And they were actually going to look for the bodies of three of their fellow slain civil rights workers. Goodman, Schroner, and Cheney. And during the day, they would hide in barns and sheds. At night, they would look in ditches and trenches. And ironically enough, those bodies were found behind the home of Edgar A. Killen, who was one of the local sheriff's deputies and ministers at the time. And that was this young man from Denmark's first indoctrination into the freedom movement or civil rights struggle. And you know, when I, when I think about this question of where do we go from here, it brings me to the man that we celebrate. It brings me to Dr. King and one of his greatest books that he ever wrote. <laughs> Probably because you can read it in one sitting, but it was still an amazing book. He gave us that challenge of where do we go from here, and he gave us two choices. He said chaos or community. Chaos or community. And so when I think about this young man from Denmark and I think about the fact that his first indoctrination, his first mission was to go to Philadelphia, Mississippi, and I think about what happened next. I think about the fact that he became involved in the most deadly civil rights demonstration that this country has ever seen. Because this young man from Denmark who went to Howard, who befriended Stokely Carmichael, who dropped out of Howard University, he then came back to South Carolina. And on February 6th, 1968, he and the students at South Carolina State College, as it was known at the time, decided they were going to protest the All-Star Bowling Alley. The history books call it Jim Crow's final hiding place, the last vestige of discrimination. In fact, it sits in the right angle. It's on Russell Street, not far from the campus. It's actually tucked back in that right angle. And on February 6th, the students decided they were going to 
go down and protest, and they were going to clap and chant and sing protest hymns. And they did. And if you think about it, they were tucked back in that right angle, but then Orangeburg City Police and South Carolina State Troopers began to surround many of the students. And as the students began to clap and chant, the state troopers began to press up against the students, and the students began to press up against the glass, and then the glass broke. And the proverbial all hell broke loose. City police and state troopers began to beat many of the students. But they beat them not with normal police batons, but they beat them with batons for about this long, and at the end they had these leather rawhide whips. There's a young man named uh, James Stroman who tells a story about seeing one of his classmates, Emma McCain, who's actually an Augusta, Georgia native. She was being held by two state troopers while another one beat her. And the students that night, they were protesting simply to have the right to bowl. And they had to go back to their campus and they had to heal not only their physical wounds, but they had to heal their, their mental wounds and emotional wounds as well. And then came February 7th. 1968. I think older people use the adjective that the tension was so thick you can cut it with a knife. I kind of say it's like when you're playing your high school rival and you're in the parking lot and you're like, Mama, let's get to the car because something's about to pop off. <laughs> Everyone was a little uneasy, but nothing happened. But then came that fateful day of February 8th, 1968, when the students at South Carolina State college decided they were going to protest the all-star bowling alley again. And when they went down, the state troopers came and they surrounded the students, but this time the students got the right idea. They went back to their beloved campus and they built this huge bonfire because they felt safe in their numbers. They were gathered together much as we've gathered here today for a singular cause and a common good because they couldn't foresee what would happen next. They didn't foresee that those state troopers would line up along the embankment in front of their beloved campus. They didn't foresee that they would close ranks like they did. They didn't foresee that they would have shotguns loaded with deadly double-eyed buckshots or the same bullets we used to hunt deer, and they didn't foresee that those bullets would be turned on them with deadly intent. And for eight seconds, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, Shots were fired into the group of students. They killed three, Henry Smith, Samuel Hammond, and Delano Middleton, and wounded another 28. This young man from Denmark was actually shot in the shoulder that night. And when he got to the infirmary, they told him there was nothing they could do for him there. He had to go to the hospital. When he got to the hospital, he was pointed out, ironically enough, by the only black sheriff deputy in Orangeburg County at the time, and he was actually arrested. And he was arrested. And between Orangeburg, South Carolina, and Columbia, South Carolina, is about a 30-mile stretch. And the interstate was completely blocked off. Everyone who was on was forced off, and nobody else was let on. He was charged with five felony counts, looking at a maximum of 75 years in prison. In between the time of the Orangeburg massacre, as the history books write this, and the time of his trial, all eight officers who fired shots into the group of students were tried. You're going to find this ironic, like history doesn't really change, it just repeats itself. And all eight officers were found not guilty. This young man from Denmark actually went to trial. They called it the prototypical kangaroo court. The lead investigator testified that he had forgotten the evidence, so he had to go back to Columbia, South Carolina to get it. When he came back, he said it must have been lost or destroyed in the years between the trial. He said, uh, he did remember this young man from Denmark, not on the night of the 8th, but a night of the 6th, standing on top of a fire truck, lighting a bick and saying, burn, baby, burn. And so they backdated the indictment and charged this young man from Denmark with rioting. And he was charged, tried, and convicted of rioting, becoming the first and only one-man riot in the history of this country. But when you look at him today and you see that his eyes don't pop like they used to, from shedding so many tears from the loss of so many civil rights heroes and sheroes. Or you see that his shoulders don't stand as upright as they once did from carrying the burdens of so many generations, and you ask him, what's the greatest sacrifice you had to make? He'll tell you that the greatest sacrifice he had to make was not being in jail or losing his freedom, per se, but it was being in jail for the birth of his oldest daughter or my big sister. Because this young man from Denmark who grew up into a civil rights hero was my father. Dr. Cleveland Sellers, 
And the lessons that I learned from people like Henry Smith and Samuel Hammond and Delano Middleton and Jimmy Lee Jackson and Majeska Simpkins and Septima Clark, even before you get to Martin, Malcolm, and Rosa, the names that they really teach you in school, but they don't teach you about the Marion Berries and the Julian Bonds. When you think about the sacrifices that all of these individuals made and you ask yourself the answer to the next question, which is where do we go from here, understanding that we have two choices, which are chaos or community, you understand that the answer lies fundamentally in the ability for us to dream with our eyes open. And so you're going to be like, y'all brought this dude all the way down here to tell me to dream with my eyes open. <laughs> this sounds like some be all you can be type stuff. <laughs> Let me explain to you what that looks like. I was telling a class earlier today that when I was, when I was 20 years old, I had just graduated Morehouse College. Went home, I had a little Morehouse swag to me. So I sauntered down the steps into my kitchen and I told my parents that I was gonna run for the South Carolina House of Representatives at the ripe age of 20. Um, my mom said that she would vote for me, my dad said he would think about it. <laughs> so I knew I had a very, very long way to go. I went out and I knocked on over 2,600 doors and went to over 55 churches and I had to explain, because some of y'all are city folk, I had to explain this to Cory Booker one time who's from Newark, where apparently people live on top of each other in these high rises. We don't really have that down south. It's like you knock on a door, drive another mile, and knock on another door. So I'm very <laughs> proud of my 2,600 door accomplishment. <laughs> June 13, 2006, I was running against someone who was 82 years old, had been in office for 26 years, longer than I had been born. We made history. We won. It was one of the most amazing days of my life. I became the youngest black elected official in the country, youngest state legislator in the country. But Something was happening in our world then. In 2006, you know, there was a campaign for president going on. There was a new energy out there. And because I was so young and so involved, I was getting these phone calls from everybody. I was getting these phone calls from Dennis Kucinich and John Edwards. I was getting these phone calls from Bill and Hillary Clinton. I was getting these phone calls from, from Barack and Michelle Obama. And so uh, finally, I had narrowed my choices down. I felt like a five-star athlete. I felt like Travis Best. <laughs> I, I felt like, or Jadavion Clowney, since I'm a Gamecock fan, but I, I, I found myself deciding between Barack Obama and John Edwards. And then I get a private phone call as I'm pulling up in the con law class. I'm the only state legislator with a book bag. <laughs> and let me just advise the students in the room, just so you know, we need to do this PSA now. Um, if someone calls you from a private number, it's one of two people. It's either somebody very important or it's a student loan company calling you to get their money back. <laughs> so y'all just need to be really cognizant of that right now, okay? And so I, I, I pick up the phone and they say, do you have time to speak to Senator Obama? And I said, of course, right? And it wasn't our first time. I hadn't met him before, talked to him many times before. And I had a little brain freeze because I had forgotten that he was a professor in, in, at University of Chicago in con law. And so I told him I was going to con law, and I hadn't been to class in weeks, so I didn't know where we were. And he started asking me what cases we were on and all of this stuff, and it was a little disconnect in the conversation. And uh, the, the senator said, you know, now is the time. He said, I want you to endorse me to be president of the United States. I said, Senator, I do so under two conditions. One, my mom gets to work on the campaign, and two, you come to my district. And he said, okay. And so I travel all across the country. I have a, usually travel sometimes with... Uh, uh, Tatiana Ali or uh, Harold and Kumar, um, not Harold and Kumar, but uh, what's, what's his name? You know, Harold from Harold and Kumar. Um, and so we travel all across the South and all across the country. And finally, they call and say, the senator wants to make good. He wants to come to your district. I'm from a very poor rural area. I have no place to put Barack Obama in 2008 in my district. So I say, let's do it at South Carolina State. We'll do it in the gymnasium that's named after Henry Smith, Samuel Hammond, and Delano Middleton, right near where they were shot. And we're going to have this amazing event. And so I pull up and I have my security. It's the most amazing thing. People are coming from everywhere. This is when Barack Obama was at the height of Obama mania. People were driving from Georgia and Tennessee just to touch the hem of his garment. It was the most amazing thing ever. <laughs> and you can just imagine that there's a stage right in center court. The green room was the men's basketball locker room. And so when I walk into the green room, as people are out there, they're playing Ain't No Mountain High Enough. Sitting down is uh, Chris Tucker and Kerry Washington. 
And so me, Chris Tucker, and Kerry Washington, we're just chatting it up, chatting for about 30, 45 minutes, hour. Everything's late in politics. And then my good friend Rick Wade comes in, and Rick says, I'm going to go to the Orangeburg Airport. I'll be right back. Rick goes to the Orangeburg Airport and comes back with Usher. So it's me, Usher, Chris. This is a true story. <laughs> Y'all are, goodness, I, I, I'm at an engineering pro. You got to have facts here. I just can't throw stuff out there. So yes, it's me, Usher, Chris Tucker, and Kerry Washington waiting on Barack Obama. And so uh, finally, the senator gets there. He was, uh, I can't remember what part of the state or country he was in. He gets there. And they say, you know, it's go time. And this is the most amazing event. This is my hometown. And I didn't get a good introduction at this event like I got from Alex. I got the voice of God, which is in now welcome to the stage, Representative Bakari Sellers. And I'm in my hometown, so the feeling is so amazing that I'm, run, I'm going out. People are grabbing you. I'm signing babies. Like the rails are shaking. <laughs> You're walking to the stage. It is the most amazing thing. And I get on stage, and um, I mentioned this a little earlier as well, but I, I get a chance to talk about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. And it drives me crazy that people like the rhythmic cadence of his speech. They love the I have a dream that one day we shall. And they forget about the rest of the speech. The most important part of that speech is when he talks about the fierce urgency of now. When he talks about the importance of that moment and how you can change the world in that moment, oh, but a second, right? And so I talk about that, and I turn around, and I introduce uh, Chris Tucker. And the decibel level goes up a little bit higher. Chris comes out, then Chris turns around, and Chris introduces uh, Usher. Usher. And women start passing out. <laughs> and then Usher introduces Kerry Washington, and then Kerry Washington introduces Barack Obama. And so we have this moment on stage where we're all supposed to stand on stage while Barack Obama speaks, but it's unbelievably loud and pandemonium. But we have this moment. To my left is Chris Tucker. To my right is the President of the United States. To the right of the President of the United States is Kerry Washington. And to her right is Usher Raymond. And we take this picture. And everyone asked me what I was thinking. And to be honest, I was thinking that I was 19 miles away from when I actually came downstairs and told my parents I was going to run for the South Carolina House of Representatives. I was only 19 miles away from where I really had this dream with my eyes open that I thought I could change the world. I was only 19 miles away from where I felt as if I could set an agenda that other people would believe in and follow because I simply felt that no matter if you were black or white, you really wanted to see the world change, and that was my goal every single day. I was only 19 miles away from where I made that decision to dream with my eyes open, but I had gone so far. And so as I took that picture, the next day it was on Us Weekly and entertainment tonight and all this stuff. It was amazing. I got a chance as a 22, 23 year old kid from a community where we had three stoplights and a blinking light, where we had wooden backboards on all of our, ba on all of our basketball goals, where for fun during the summer we literally jumped ditches. That was an amazing activity as a childhood youth to jump a ditch. And I just thought about this concept of dreaming with my eyes open because I was able to imagine it here, want to change the world here, order my steps, and then play a part of history. And so when, you, when you're on this journey to excellence, when we're setting this agenda for the world that looks as if it's spinning out of control, who was I speaking with earlier today? We were talking about how the world is moving fast, and he said the world is, is people think, some of the people think it's spinning out of control. He's our, at lunch with us earlier today. And so a lot of people look around and they say that it's just pure chaos, pure pandemonium. But the challenge for all of us on this journey to excellence is to ask ourselves these very two sim simple questions. Understand how far we've come. Refocus and center. Answer the next question, which is where do we go from here? Dream with your eyes open. And then understand that the goal is nothing less than excellence. How many educators are in the room? Raise your hand. Let me tell you all something. The greatest educator of all time is Benjamin E. Mays. I'm sorry. I just have to break it to you, OK? <laughs> Benjamin E. Mays once said that in all things that you do, you do them so well that no man living, dead, or yet to be born can do them better. Just think about that. Think about on this journey to excellence that we're taking. In all things that you do, do them so well that no man living, dead, or yet to be born can do them better. The country 
demands that. We should all expect that. We live in a culture of low expectation right now, and the worst part about that is oftentimes you get what you expect. We live in communities where kids are not taught that they can be doctors. You know why? Because they haven't never seen a black doctor. It's hard to tell a kid he can be a scientist or be George Washington Carver if he's never seen a black scientist. It's the most amazing thing we can do if we can set that example and we can show that on this journey to excellence, we're not just going to run this race, but we're going to win it. So as we're setting this agenda that we'll flush out in some questions, as we're talking about this next civil rights movement, I dare not come up here and say that I've done something on my own. I'll kind of finish where I started by talking about the two most important words in the English language, which are the words thank you. Because on the days when we remember and we celebrate, and sometimes the post office is even closed on Martin Luther King's birthday, we also have to remember those names that are not taught. We also have to remember that there would be no Hillary Clinton if there was no Shirley Chisholm. There'd be no Hillary Clinton if there was no Fannie Lou Hamer. There would be no educators like Dr. Irvin if there was no Benjamin E. Mays. We stand on the shoulders of so many heroes and sheroes who deserve for us to continue this journey, to take the baton and not just run the race, but run the race to excellence. And I know a lot of us are beaten up. A lot of us are worn down. But we have to just take a moment to just refresh ourselves and say thank you. Thank you to those heroes who came before us for just allowing us to stand on their shoulders. And then, especially me, be a little partisan, I have to fight this race at least over the next four years and use all of my energy to do it. But I want you all there with me because this journey demands everything that we have. So with that, I'll take a few questions. Yeah, just, I don't care how we do it, just stand up so I can at least hear you. So, uh, Dr. King was ahead of his time when he talked about the, the triplets of evil. Yeah. Racism, capitalism, military. We talked about this last night on CNN. Did you watch? You like you watch. You watch Fox News, don't you? <laughs> talked about a military-industrial complex. In his last conversation with uh, Harry Belafonte, uh, King told him that, uh, I've come to believe that we're integrating into a burning house, right? So in this uh, hyper-capitalist society, um, how do we ensure that we ensure Dr. King's message of equality and peace doesn't get lost? Or is, a, uh, is capitalism inherently odd with his message? No, and capitalism is not inherently at odds with this message, I don't believe. I, don't, I, I wouldn't dare believe that Dr. King was socialist, fascist, communist, or anything else of the sort. But I will tell you this. Do you know what Dr. King was doing in Memphis, Tennessee, before he died? He was there actually marching and protesting with sanitation workers for wages. Um, Dr. King fundamentally understood something that we have let exacerbate, something that we have let just grow out of proportion, um, which are the income inequality gaps that we have in this country. I think that, and it's not that I think, I know that in this country the gap between the billionaires, and I'm a, I'm a the billionaires and millionaires, the I'm channel my Bernie Sanders, the, the, the gap between the billionaires and the haves and have-nots continues to grow. And until we begin to pay attention to those people, those, I like to say that when I get on TV I speak for the voiceless, I give a voice to the voiceless, but Really, that's what I try to do, and that's what I challenge you to do. That's what Dr. King was doing by giving a voice to those sanitation workers. We have to continue to stand up for those people who oftentimes would go unheard. Those people who work every day, who, it's, it's amazing. We only have two states in the entire union where working a minimum wage job, you can afford to live in a one-bedroom apartment. I mean, just think about that. People work 40 hours a week and are still in poverty. I mean, we have so many people who give their all, and this is what Dr. King was talking about. And so 
especially when we, when we have this discussion about democratic politics, democratic in terms of democratic party politics, people have this discussion oftentimes about whether or not you can focus on, uh, on um, giving a voice to uh, issues such as immigration or criminal justice reform, or you have to focus on the white rural middle class in middle America who may have lost a job, you know, or you have to focus on the progressive left. I think that you can focus on all of those things. I think that intersectionality and Kimberly Crenshaw's amazing thesis of intersectionality, I don't know if you've ever read Kimberly Crenshaw, she's from UCLA, she's brilliant, she talks about intersectionality, demands that of us. Questions? Yes? You gotta run. If you have a question, just come on over here to the mic. So, um, Attorney Sellers, um, as I'm sure you know, um, a lot of um, millennials is the, the buzzword, um, especially um, the black millennials have become really disillusioned and distrustful of the political system, but we all know as well that um, you can't get things, in the, things done in this country and affect change without understanding and being involved in politics. So what would you say to um, younger people, especially young black people who feel that the political system is not the way that they're going to like, achieve the equality that they're seeking? I mean, that's a tough question. I mean, I, I think that it's, it's necessary to have a, a healthy dose of cynicism. Um, I think it's necessary to make sure that you hold the people who you elect and who are in positions of power accountable. I don't think it's wrong for anyone to ask for um, those who are in positions of power to have ethics and be transparent. I think we can demand all of those things. But I also think that sometimes we lose focus of how we get here or how we got here. I think many times we forget that, um, I was on The Breakfast Club with my friend Charlemagne the God, and what? I don't believe any of my stories, do you? <laughs> um, I was on The Breakfast Club, and I, and I talked about how some people attempt to take a stand by saying they're going to sit out the process. I'm a big Colin Kaepernick fan. In fact, I got like three of his jerseys, right? And I, when he said that he didn't vote, I just wanted to reach over there and grab him real quick and have a good personal conversation with him. I still rock with Colin, but I think he made a faux pas. But with that being said, I think that we forget sometimes that people literally died. People gave up their lives. Um, the blood is real blood. The sweat is real sweat. Um, for many of us, especially African Americans in the South, we don't have to read about the Civil Rights Movement in a history book. You know, we, the, we, we understand the smell of, of gun smoke. We know people who felt the, the lash of water hoses. You could probably go in your community. Where are you from? I was from College Park, like to the southwest. Oh, yeah, you can go, right, to College Park and go down the street on the corner and find somebody who knew Dr. King and marched with Julian Bond or, or knew John Lewis. I mean, we, don't, we forget that we stand on the shoulders of so many people. And unfortunately, we only remember those during King Holiday and Black History Month. But I think that we have to begin, especially people like you and I, we have to make sure that we're, we're pushing our brothers and sisters who are our age to continue this fight. I think that's the most important part. Without us, we'll lose. Disinformation will win. Um, this whole bubble theology where people are just retreating them to, to, the, to their own personal bubbles, um, and they don't care about what um, other people are doing. We will have no empathy. I think it's incumbent upon all of us just to put our shoulder to the wheel and make sure that other young people understand that we have to get up. We have to get up, get out, show up, and show out. And I, I, you also have to caution yourself to understand that if you look at the civil rights movement, everybody wasn't a part of it. So everybody ain't going to be a part of your movement. You just need to know that. You can't look around and expect everyone to be on the same team you are. But what you can do is be a beacon of light for others to follow. And I think being an example is probably the best thing you can do right now. Thank you. Thank you. If you have a question, it can, it can be more than one, so you can line up and we can just, we can just knock them out. Um, I'm an international student. I just wanted to, so I, it enables, enables you to see a different perspective when you come from somewhere else. You see the differences that most people don't see because you know, they're used to it. And, I mean, based on the question I'm about to ask, it's just, 
speaking, the first thing that I saw when I came to the States, even educated ones in college, even probably more rampant of the ones in college or the ones who are not in college, is there's, there's a cage in, in the mind. It's weird, like uh, there's an anger. And that this anger is, it, the conversation you have with them, it can go as simple as to the most complex. And ba based on that, I, I, I translated it to social media like Twitter. There's a lot of reactions online. There's a lot of reactions online. You go through a stream of Twitter feeds and so many reactions and angry people, legit angry. But I'm wondering, how is it possible? Because they have legitimate gripe or based on what he said, how do you translate that? How is the most, what's the most effective way to change that reaction to action and actually you know, get it out? First of all, if I had the answer to that question, Hillary Clinton would be president, and I would be like king of the world. Uh, so that is a that is a tough that is a tough tough uh, nut to crack. You know, the first thing I try to do, and I just said this again, so pardon me for repetition, is I try to be an example. That's first. I think that's something we can all do. But even second, I think we have to give people a reason to move. I think we have to give people something to vote for, something to be a part of. Um, and, and I think I don't want to say that's unfortunate, but we have to meet people where they are. There was an article in the New York Times. I don't know how many people read the New York Times. It depends on where you fall. Some people said that's fake news now, too, I guess. I don't know. Um, and so there was an article in the New York Times about a group of people from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, who decided that they were not going to participate in the election. It was a group of black barbers. And they just said, you know, nobody speaks to me. I don't feel like it. You know, this isn't about us. You know, no one, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, neither one of them are talking to our issues. No one's come by to see us, this, that, and the third. And see, it's hard for me to, to make that mental leap to say, well, this is an obligation. You're supposed to do it, because that's going to fall on deaf ears. You know, you need to do it because my father almost died, so you would have the right to do it. That doesn't really resonate with everyone. But what I do have to be able to show is that it affects people's bottom line. It affects your college tuition. It affects your health care. It affects your small business. It affects everything that goes on around you. And so you have to play a role in this process, because if you do not play a role in this process, it will eat you up. In this country, especially as African Americans, you have systems of oppression. Okay. Sometimes it's very hard for me, especially when I'm on CNN, to explain to people what systems of oppression really mean. It's very hard for me to explain intersectionality to people. And I think that the systems of oppression have really beaten many of our brothers and sisters up to the point of hopelessness. And I think until we unravel these systems of oppression, we're going to continue to have this epidemic of hopelessness. These systems of oppression look like this. It looks like an educational system that punishes you because of your zip code. Because you're not really, you don't get to choose when you're fourth grade, you know, whether or not you're going to have pre-K, what school you're going to go to, if they're going to care about you, you know, if they're going to care about that you have a slight learning disability or that your parents ain't home after school. They're not going to care about all of this stuff. So we live in a, a, in a country where you're punished for your zip code based in your educational system. That's one system. Then you have a system of, of environmental injustices. Right? That's a new one. It's been going on for years, but people just started caring about it. Let me tell you where Flint, Michigan ain't going to happen. In Cobb County. OK, that's first. <laughs> so after you have the environmental injustices and you have the educational injustices, think about a criminal justice system that doesn't care who you are, how many degrees you have. And when you think about these things, when I explain to people what racism is or what any ism is, they want me to allow them to feel soothed by the fact that it, the bathrooms and water fountains no longer say whites only. But it's still there in these systems. Now, there's a question about whether or not these systems were broken or whether or not these systems were built like this. It's a fair question to ask. But I do believe that we can reform these systems. And so what I'm trying to do in a multifaceted way with every bit of energy I have is convince the people that you're talking about is I'm trying to treat this ailment of hopelessness, understanding why they're hopeless by reforming each one of these systems. So the question is, where are you going to help me out? Because this is a lot of work to do. Question. 
Yes, uh, thanks for uh, being here today. So you and I would say, you're 32, I'm 33, I, I would call us the, the OMs, we're original millennials, right? Man, don't, don't make up that new, man, I don't want to be. <laughs> Give me a whole new, a whole new thing. Uh, but the, but, but what, I, what I mean by that is our parents are more than likely baby boomers. We I want you to know that I quoted today, I ain't yeah. going to say who said it. I was saying that at a school, I believe it's in the state of Georgia, I'm pretty sure it's UGA, they teach a class on outcasts. Yeah, Savannah. Hey. It was, it's Savannah State? Yeah, Savannah State. It's Savannah State. I thought it was, I gave UGA too much credit. Savannah State. Yeah. <laughs> and somebody had the audacity to say, Outcast, the band? Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they should be held back a year. That hurt. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they should be held back a year. That's a or or we're going to start an impeachment process right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I, I say that because uh, we have. Uh, that age range has a unique mix of, of X generation, uh, baby boomers, uh, those, those qualities. And so my question to you is, seeing the last eight years, and I'll, I'll say this before I ask my question, I always thought that one of the President Obama's biggest flaws was that, and I would say this uh, cynically, that, uh, that he didn't get Joe Biden to come out and say a lot of things that he wanted to do. I think at that point, the country would have been a little bit more uh, <laughs> palatable to swallow in a few of his things. And you see so let the white guy say it, it would have gone over it well. Been, it would have been perfectly fine. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about that so one, but that's, that, that, I, that, I that, that's my, I haven't that's my thought cynical, about that. I don't think that theory is true, but okay, go. Okay. But I, and I say <laughs> that because of this. What we've seen, I believe, over the last, I would say, eight to 10 years is a, a, a willful ignorance of being anti-intellectual, anti school, anti-technology. And we tend to, I, I work for J.P. Morgan Chase, I'm a commercial bank, and I tell people all the time, uh, immigrants aren't taking manufacturing jobs, it's the, it's the quad 3200. You can't stop it. You know, I've, I've seen, I mean, Amazon Go is coming out with something where you can go in and pick up a sandwich, and it can charge your uh, mm -hmm. account, which will undoubtedly make cashiers uh, uh, take those jobs away. And so you have, a, you have people that are, how do you adjust those systems with people that are willfully ignorant and, and anti-intellectual to the point, and, I, and I, I see you battle on CNN all the time, and I wonder, I'm like, There's a lot of anti-intellectualism on yeah, TV. Yeah, there, how, you, 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 it's, I always see you can't get it out the rut because, again, coming from the corporate world, you know, I was taught as a manager that you, people have the skill or the will. You can teach somebody that has the will, the skill, but you can't teach somebody the skill who doesn't have the will. And I think a lot of the country, both on whether it's uh, young African Americans, uh, brown Americans, and white Americans, with ever, you have a, seg a segment of the take my country back and also the segment of woke people. They're, they're just, just, they're highly unintellectual. Yeah. And they're not, they're not smart about what they're doing. So, I mean, it is a challenge. I mean, I, I think one of the things that, and I think the president addressed this last night in an hour, way more eloquently mm -hmm. than I'm going to address it in a five-minute re retort, but I think that he laid out many things that contribute to us building and making sure that we strengthen our democracy. Uh, the first is that we have this culture of anti-intellectualism. I'm not a big Jonathan McWhorter fan, but he did write a good piece on anti-intellectualism. And it, you know, it is becoming pervasive on, on both sides. And I think this will be my third time saying it, but people actually now, instead of getting news to an, expand their worldview, they just get news to reinforce their opinions. And then if the news doesn't reinforce their opinions, they kick it aside as fake news, right? And so that is a very difficult discussion. On TV, I have these debates all the time, and I realize that I'm never debating the person in front of me. I'm always debating for the people who are watching. Um, you're usually debating for the one and a half million people at any given point who probably are watching you on TV, not trying to change that person's mind. But one of the things we have to do is begin to have serious conversations. My friend who just sat down over there was talking about social media. And we kind of need to break away from having discussions in 140 characters. Pew Research came out and said 69% of all adults, 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 69% of all adults, think about this, 69% of all adults get their news off Twitter. I mean, you're talking about uh, 140 characters without context, right? That you can't even edit. You, Jack hasn't made it so you can edit, edit Twitter yet. So that is where you're getting your news from. Um, and so when you're thinking about this, we do have a culture of anti-intellectualism that's on the right, it's on the left, it's black, it's white, it's other, it's gay, it's straight, it doesn't matter. 
And it's very hard to, to, we have to become individuals and citizens to make sure that we're focused on at least having conversations with people. That is what we're missing in this whole, whole discussion. I don't think, you, you start off by saying Barack Obama had a flaw in this really weird political theory that you came up with. <laughs> um, by, by letting Joe Biden be the mouthpiece, which is an interesting concept because you can't control anything that comes out of Joe Biden's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how well that would have gone over in the White House. <laughs> let Joe say it. No, please. <laughs> if anything is please God, don't let Joe say it. <laughs> That's usually how it goes. Great, absolutely phenomenal man, like phenomenal man. Um, but I do think that the president has been an example and he showed this country not what we were or what we are, but what we can be. And I think that that is probably one of the, uh, one of the legacies that Barack Obama is going to teach us. Another thing is, um, there's a question about whether or not um, the issue of race, which you hinted on as well, um, has become, uh, or racism has become more prevalent in the eight years that Barack Obama has been president of the United States. The answer to that question is no. Um, and the reason that it's no is because I think it's, you can see it more because we have social media and things of that nature. But it's not, it, it's always been there. I mean, it ain't like it never, it just went away. It ain't like people stopped being racist or people stopped being anti-Semitic. I mean, you can just see it now. Um, and so that, that makes me a little bit crazy. People oftentimes, especially on TV, they say, well, what about Chicago? And I'm like, well, what about Chicago? <laughs> and so they wanna say, they wanna talk about you know, gun violence and, and all of these things. And, you know, if you, if you are having a discussion, because I want people in this room to be able to have more discussions, and people begin to, when you're having discussions with people about racism or race and Barack Obama or anything else, and they talk about, well, what about gun violence? Then you have to ask yourself those questions, and you have to be able to go through that logically and say, well, one, personally, I think, and I said this earlier today, that gun violence needs to be treated as a public health crisis, right? And two, you have to go and look at why it's occurring. It's occurring because you have places that are desolate. You have places literally in Chicago where you have food deserts, where you, don't, where you can't go to a market and get fresh fruits or fresh vegetables, where you have an education system, which is deplorable. I, I actually asked Rahm Emanuel to resign. He looked at me all crazy last night. He reads the newspaper, by the way. And so, you know, you have all of these different layers of, of oppression that are right there in Chicago, which breed this violence. And don't talk to me about, do not talk to me about this outbreak that's occurring without even dealing with the root cause of it. And so I say all of that to say that I, I think that we have issues that can be resolved if this country is willing to have a conversation. Thank you. But as Dr. Irvin said, what's the, what's the hardest conversation to have in this country right now? Race is the hardest country to have in the hardest conversation to have in this country right now. Do I have time for three more? Yeah. Do we have any women that want to ask questions? <laughs> I usually do really well with women in the audience. This is bothering me. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, so, so you raise a, a you, you keep mentioning systems of oppression throughout your, 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 your talk today. I think that's really interesting. Um, you know, drawing from uh, Michelle Alexander's book um, about, you know, how racism is transformed and uh, through, through Jim Crow and how, um, you, what we're dealing with nowadays is it's not as overt, it's not as direct, right? It's embedded into systems. Correct. And um, she was talking about the, the new Jim Crow and then being embedded in the criminal justice system. Right, 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 right. Or even more specifically in our prison industrial complex. And so I, I, I recall an interview with uh, uh, the president, I think it was NPR, and he was, uh, he, he got a question regarding how some um, people in the African-American community felt like and this is a common critique for him, that he did not uh, directly engage um, as powerfully as he could on some of these issues. It, his response to that was simply that, you know, with the, the form that racism takes uh, nowadays is not as overt, right? It's system. So, I'm, I, you know, it's not going to be productive for me to come at it the way that, you know, uh, Malcolm X might have come at it, right? Because that's not the way things work nowadays. Uh, but, it, it, so this is, this is the Oval Office, it's different, right? But in terms of civil rights, you know, what does that mean in terms of an approach, right? How does that... So, to, answer, to, to kind of answer your question, in this whole civil rights movement thing that we're talking about, 
everybody has different roles to play. All right, and I said this earlier, and this is so true. Barack Obama, if he was the president that we wanted, he wouldn't be president. But he was the president that we needed. Okay? I think that's first and foremost. Malcolm X ain't getting elected president of the United States of America. I mean, y'all could just, <laughs> what would Malcolm X have done in the White House? Malcolm X wouldn't have been in the White House. Okay? <laughs> so that, that's first. But also, there is, this, there, is, there is this, and we were talking about this earlier, but there's this system of misinformation. Barack Obama is leaving the White House right now for the first time in American history with fewer prisoners in the prison system than when he got there. He's granted more prisoners clemency than the last eight presidents combined. Violent crime has gone down in this country, minus Baltimore, Washington, D.C., and Chicago. So, I mean, when you're, looking at these, when you're looking at statistics like that and what has he done for these systems, you can look at that system, right? Look at income inequality. We have two million less people in poverty now than we did in 2007. Well, just to be clear, I'm not necessarily critiquing his performance. What I'm saying is in terms of an approach, he's talking about I, I, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't necessarily believe he can directly engage that's, these things. And that's fine. And my only point is that that was Barack Obama's role, right? Right. But for every Barack Obama, we also need a D-Ray, right? For every D-Ray, we also need a tip, we have a T-I. Excuse me, he's a rapper, by the way. <laughs> we also need a T-I or a J. Cole. You know, we also need people who are playing their role in, or, 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 you know, they're staying in their lane in art. The, the, the civil rights movement was made up of, of a collection of beings, Jewish beings, black beings. It was made up of artists. It was made up of of people who would throw something through your window. You know, it was made up of people who believed in, in, in the whole spectrum trying to get to a goal. And so, yeah, that may not be Barack Obama's place, but that may be yours to fill that void. And so that's what we have to fill. You have to figure out where you fit in this movement. I got two more questions. I'm gonna just, if you both ask them, then I'll answer them together and wrap up. Um, this is a question for education and equ equality. So this might gonna be a little touchy subject. <laughs> I don't have any secrets. Okay. <laughs> so for the special needs kids like such as myself mm -hmm. and that wants to get in, into college, such as Georgia Tech or UGA, so what do you think that the legislative um, church would do or say that'll make the president say, okay, we're going to make this more easier for the special needs kids to have education more than like the regular kids? That's a good question. I'm going to answer that one. Go ahead, ask us. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. Uh, I wrote my question down. Uh, just okay. That means it's short. Yes. And okay. connect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, so this summer I was turned on to a book called Silent Covenants by Derek Bell. Although I haven't read it yet, its ideas were conveyed to me. Uh, Bell discusses how Brown v. Board missed the point. He argues that the logic behind Brown v. Board was the achievement gap between black and white children would magically be solved by black children having the privilege of being in the same classroom of as Of course, he said the integration was a, yeah, go ahead. And by some osmosis, the learning would flow from white children to black children in the same room. My question is, what do we do about civil rights victories that might seem to miss the point, even if they're well-intentioned? Do we take it as a victory? Do we demand more? Okay. I'm going to tell you what you can tell Derek Bell in a minute. <laughs> your question was a very good question, and I think that um, you have to raise your voice every chance you get, because you're blessed and fortunate enough to be in this room right now. And even by asking that question, there are people who didn't know that you had that concern or that that concern existed. Right? And so you're doing the first part that you're supposed to do. Don't ever let anybody tell you to shut up, sit down, and be quiet. All right? You don't look like you're going to do that anyway. No. <laughs> but don't let anybody tell you My that. My mom told me better than that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so make sure you always speak up and speak out. And then you need to be the leader that wants to address those problems. I will tell you a secret. The president is sitting, of this institution, is sitting right here on the front row. And so I would start with him. And don't ever, <laughs> don't, don't ever say that you got to go to a vice president or you got to go to a dean across campus. You need to go and sit down until he talks to you. Okay. and addresses your problem so that you understand how you can make it better for students with special needs at Georgia Tech, and then maybe that will translate at Savannah State, maybe that will translate at UGA, and may, you never know. You might start something. Okay. See, he wants Thank to talk you. to you. <laughs>
Uh huh. The, la the last question was somehow everybody. Uh, my, I, I mess with my father about this all the time about the civil rights movement. Where did you Where did you go? I mess with my father about this. About this. we talk about this all the time. Uh, should the civil rights movement have been focused on economic empowerment for African Americans and not integration? You know, the best part about people like Derrick Bell and others is that hindsight is 2020, right? He went back there, um, you know, with his children, you know, walking in the snow in Clarendon County, trying to figure out if they were going to file a lawsuit so that they could actually have buses then. You know, he wasn't getting beat like everybody else, just to simply say 40 years later as some academic that it was wrong. You know, their goal was wrong, their premise was wrong. That's kind of faulty logic. Um, it, it actually is, it's actually um, intellectualism that lacks empathy. I think, which as an intellectual, you probably need to learn a taste of empathy. Um, and so I, I think that there are things that we can do to build on that movement. There are certain things that the civil rights movement, it got us about 55 yards of the way, and there are 45 more yards to go. Um, and what we have to do is we have to stand on those shoulders, and whatever your movement may be, don't let the movement pass you by. So with that, I say thank you, and God bless you all. Ooh, I went over. I'm sorry. So, Bakari, and not Bacardi. <laughs> Bacari. Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of the Georgia Tech community uh, for your words of inspiration and reminding us of the challenge that Dr. King set before us more than 50 years ago. Um, it's up to us, chaos or community, and I think most of us understand what that challenge means to all of us. On behalf of our planning committee and the Institute, I want to offer this as a token of our appreciation you. for you being here today. And thank you so much for your presence today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So when President Peterson was here, he mentioned a number of programs that are planned over the next two weeks uh, in celebration and comm commemoration of Dr. Martin Luther King's life and legacy. Uh, we invite you to look at those and uh, where possible, hope that you are able to participate in what will be some exciting opportunities to engage other people around these topics and issues. I would be remiss if I did not uh, ask those of the planning committee and the sponsors who are here, who've worked for the past five, six, seven, whatever months we've done this, to stand up to be acknowledged for the work that you've done. And I'll say thank you personally. So those of the planning committee and sponsors, please stand. And last and not least, I want to thank all of you sincerely for being here today, for without you, this conversation would be a, a very small group conversation and not the impact that we'd want to have, so thank you. So with that, thank you for being here today. Bye-bye.